Adam Glover, the Riddler. And Kevin Conroy, Batman himself. I am vengeance. I am the knight. I am Batman. If ever there was somebody who embodied Batman. Uh, so, I'm going to be asking a few questions up here, but we'd love to get questions from the audience. So what I'm asking you guys to do is if you want to just form a line right here, and then we're going to have them stand right here when they're ready to ask the question. And then I'll come up and ask you guys to ask your question away. First, I want to thank you all so much for coming. I've been big fans of Queens. I have been big fans of all your work. Um, Kevin, as we said, you are the embodiment of Batman. Thank you. You have also recently been able to play Batman live action. Wasn't that wild? <laughs> <laughs> they told me I'm going to do Batman. I got so excited. And they said, and we're putting you in a metal bodysuit. <laughs> I didn't know anything about that coming up. So it was a challenge. It was a challenge. But how did it feel having voiced Batman for so many years and now being his face? It was interesting. That's a good question because uh, we've talked about this before among us. When you do voice work, you're in a booth and you sort of live in your own imagination. You create the character in your head and you create the situation that you're in. And it's very liberating. Um, I find it very liberating. When you're working on a set, there's a camera right in front of your face. There's a cameraman behind the camera. There's a boom operator over your head. There's lighting people. There's the wardrobe woman coming up and pulling on your shirt. There's the makeup person shoving, you know? There's this whole crew that are poking and tugging at you while you're trying to create this character. So that sense of, of living in your own imagination of that character is so much harder than it is something on camera. I think, I think, for me. So it was really challenging to do it. Um, and also, the interpretation of Batman, Bruce Wayne, was totally opposite to what I have done. My Bruce Wayne never kills, um, always does the positive my Batman. And their take on it was that they asked themselves the question, what happens if someone gives and gives and gives their whole life long? What's left? And there was this sort of empty shell of a bitter old man. That was the opposite of my Batman. So that was challenging for me to play that guy, but I had a lot of fun. On the note of acting in front of the camera versus being a voice, Diane, you are... I've worked with a lot of voice actors, but it just amazed me when I see how many voices that I've heard that you've been. Uh, you were uh, Dale Arden on um, Flash Gordon. Uh, you were the original Spinnerette and uh, uh, Net Tossi on she -Ra. Um Of course, you were Poison Ivy. Um, how... How is it having done so many voices and then finding an iconic one that just everybody's attached on to. It is amazing. <laughs> it is wonderful. You do a job 30 years ago, 30, 3 years ago, and you have no idea that 30 years later, you're going to be sitting in front of, first of all, an audience like this, okay? Then also the fans that come up with stories that can break your heart or, or, or make you feel... So you wonder, as an actor, you work in a void. You have the script, you say the words, you please the director, and it's done, and you get paid and you go home. You, or actually, you go home and you get paid a lot later. But, okay. But... Then to find out that work that you did, that was a job which you loved, had an impact on people. 
changed their lives. How many people have come up to me today, just today, and said, you were my childhood? So many people. And, wow. Woo! Wow. So, so you, give, you give to us by watching our staff and doing all that stuff. We're giving to you, and we have no idea. And it's kind of wonderful. So that's how it feels. part of so many things that are, for lack of a better term, deep culture. You know, you were Gremlins 2, Mr. Clamp, I can never forget that. Uh, you were in Scrooge, you were Lionel Luther in Smallville, and you were Riddle. And um, how does it feel for you to go back and forth between being recognized for your face and being recognized for your voice separately? Well, I don't consider myself a voice actor uh, because I just did the rhythm and, uh, and then there was some shiny pants before that. But people dropped out and then moved up and I just sort of that roll of the rhythm dropped in my lap. And, uh, and I lived about a, a block or two from where it was recorded. So I, and I'm only in three episodes. And uh, um, I would walk over all these wonderful voice actors, and, uh, and I uh, had fun. I had a great time. And that I think is why the Luther, one of the reasons that the Luther is uh, so loved and adored by so many people, because uh, he, he, he just uh, throws it away. He's so cocksure of himself that he had a swell top and he's just fooling all the dummies. <laughs> Uh, do, do I do I send something autobiographical or not? <laughs> oh, you got my number. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me grab some questions here from the audience. Who's first? Hi, uh, big fan, of course. Um, uh, yes, big fan. Uh, I assist for Kevin Conroy. Uh, what was the most fun you had working on a Batman? The question was, what was the most fun project I worked on? I think the one, I, anything that involves Mark Hamill. Uh, is the most fun. Because he is a madman. <laughs> he's brilliant. He's generous. He loves watching other actors work. So he gives you a lot of energy. And, the, you know, acting is like reacting. You're only as good as the people you're working with. If you're working with someone who's like a block of wood, there's only so much you can do. But if you're working with someone who's giving you this mad, brilliant performance, you can not be good. You know what I mean? He pulls it out of you. So anything involving more. So, um, The Killing Joke, um, The Arkham Games, all that stuff is phenomenal. And he made us crack up during the recording. Sometimes we couldn't catch our breath and say yeah. our lines. Mark, I mean, he would come up with all this stuff. It was amazing. He's amazing. He's got a brain like no other. Andrea Romano, who was the casting director. Whoa, she great. One day, came into the studio and said, okay, I'm separating you two. We're taking a time out. Because we had become like two-year-olds. We were feeding off of each other, and we'd gone completely off script. She said, okay, we need, you, you need a time out. So, uh, that's, that's what he does to me. I love it. Did, uh, was most of the series recorded with multiple actors together? Well, that's a wonderful thing yes. about Warner Brothers and Dante Romano. They insist on having everyone present. So, and that's unique, because it makes the post-production harder for the studio, because getting clean takes sometimes is hard. But they know that they get much better performances from people if you have those other actors feeding them. 
So they always try to have us all together in the room. But sometimes it's impossible. Like, part of, I think it was Arkham Knight, Mark was in London doing a Star Wars comeback. So we couldn't be together. So I had to imagine what he would do. But by that point, we worked together for 20 years. So I knew. I knew. But yes, they always try to have us in the studio together. And not only that, but we as actors, most of us are theater trained. And we got to look at each other's eyes while we were talking and have actual physical reactions and, you know, facial reactions and body reactions that you don't really pick up when you do one and there and one there and one there and one there. You I think that's part of what made the show unique, Batman the Animated Series, because it was really the first time that I know of that the studios um, actively looked outside the traditional voiceover casting group. And they looked at stage actors and TV actors and film actors. Before that, there had been a, a group of actors who specialized in voices, in animation voices. And they're incredible. They're wildly talented. One person can do a dozen different voices. But they had the idea of looking beyond that. And that's how I got the job. It was the first voice job I ever got. Because I was a New York stage actor. And I happened to be in LA doing a uh, pilot for a series. And a casting director from New York knew my work from the public theater, the Shakespeare Theater in New York, and he recommended me to Andrea. So it was a, it was just a lucky break that I ended up with this job. Diane, um, was it a big difference from previous voice acting roles we've done before? I'm assuming a lot of those, if not all of the other ones prior to that, were individual recordings. No, actually, uh, a lot of the work that I did for Film Nation, all of us were there as well. Yeah, it's just what it was, was the circle that we had a semicircle with the microphones, and or it was this way actually, and the booth was there where you guys are, and the scripts were so brilliant. I'm, I'm just saying, I think the other parts of the show, the scripts were amazing, the characters were so interesting. The other stuff I'd done, not to downplay it, but was more simplistic. It just didn't need that real acting ensemble feel, where this show is just heads and tails above most of the animation that's been done. It's just that simple. Yeah. John, then you did mostly uh, acting in front of the camera, and you said this was your first, if not only, experience doing voice acting. Um, did it help being able to see the other actors? Were you in the room with some of the actors at the time? Yeah, sure. I mean, it was like we were all playing together, like, like a rehearsal for a play or whatever. And what I said about the writing, because there were three scripts that involved uh, Riddler, and it just uh, it was genius writing. So I just could go for Thank you, God, for this script, right? <laughs> and I learned something new today. Mark was in Star Wars? <laughs> Little known fact. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, what is it like from going, it's kind of a bit of two part, but they're sort of connected. Uh, what, do you, what was it like working on the animated series and going to the DC animated universe, like Justice League and stuff like that? What do you feel like the tone was changed and how did you feel like it captured all aspects of it? Is it for me? Is it for me? Yeah. Uh, it, was, it was different. The question was what was the difference between doing Batman the Animated Series and then going on to Justice League? Because unlike a lot of other cartoons, this was an ongoing universe that they had yeah. created. But the challenge for me was, I was the central character in that <laughs> the animated series. I had, you know, a half an hour to tell a story, to tell my story. In the Justice League, suddenly I'm one of seven principal characters. And I'm the strong, silent one. You know? He's the guy who never talks. Well, I'm a voice actor. So what am I going to do? So some, some episodes I'd have one or two sentences to establish who it was, you know? And you can't overdo it. 
and override. That's the temptation. Um, so it was challenging. You're right. It was challenging to, to share the stage with that many other lead characters. I'd like to imagine that you would just be standing in the booth, just quietly brooding and staring at the rest while they read their lines. Is that accurate? Please tell me that's right. That's accurate, but they wouldn't pay me. <laughs> Speaking about the transition, um, have you heard of the new Batman anime series, Batman the Cape Crusader? Uh, I, I'm not sure. I, I've heard some stuff about that. I'm not sure. I haven't heard, heard a lot. I'm just kind of curious with me because it looks like it's kind of feels like the closest to a spiritual successor to the animated series as it's going to go more into like the early 20s and 30s noir version of Batman or something like that. Is that that's the Paul Dini one? Well, the, I think that's the Paul Dini one. The question here uh, can be extended a little bit further and that is have you watched other people take on roles that you've filled, and then how does it feel seeing them take those on? Oh, of course! Dietrich Bader is a really good friend, a really close friend. Uh, I think he does a great job with Batman. Um, when I met Adam West, I was kind of nervous when he came in here with the Grey Ghost, because I was kind of treading on his territory, and I wasn't sure, you know, what the reaction would be. And he sensed that, and he, he just said, you know, it's your ride now. Have a blast. And that's my attitude about the other actors who come in to do the voices. It's their ride now. It's their turn. Uh, I love when I get chosen, but I also love hearing what other actors do with it. Same thing for Diane. Very John. generous. Yeah, that's a very generous uh, answer. What do you mean? Yeah, but it's true. It's true. Yeah, and you just. I did the voice for eight or nine years, and then they chose somebody else. And at the time, I remember thinking, what did I do wrong? Why did they do that? Now, as the years go on, and I'm appreciated for what I did do, which is nice, I love it, it's marvelous, I think, hmm, somebody else gets to have a chance. So I feel I'm more generous as I age. I was less so when I was younger. You were a bitch when you were young? Oh! Well, honey, you should know. Now you know how we talk backstage. <laughs> and on the note of that language, a young man here... There are children pleasant. Well, at least one boy wonder. For uh, Mr. Conroy, so besides from the line that you said when you first walked up, do you have a favorite line, and if so, could you say it? <laughs> Woo! In all the years to come, in all your private moments, I want you to remember, Clark, my hand at your throat. I want you to remember the one man beat you. closest to a true villain the first couple seasons of Smallville had. Right. And they, uh, and I was, uh, I had gone through a period where I started, uh, uh, 
I never had an acting teacher, and I and I was uh, start, I was in L.A. and I was getting hired a lot, and it became more about money than it did about doing the work. So I found a teacher that I had heard of for years and years, and I balled up and, and went and took a class. Um, and uh, I, I just learned how to have fun again and, and do the work. So, so there was a, a period where I wasn't enjoying it at all. And, uh, and the, with the Lionel, I could see that they'd sort of written it sort of written. They'd written a villain, you know, a kind of a comic book villain. It was not even a... So I just kept bringing more love into the man, realizing that um, he. I loved him so much I gave him shock treatment. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, everyone else saw him as giving evil, but he was giving love. <laughs> But, I, but people would stop me on the street, finally, when it, when it got going. And, and, and so we were so confused. Were you supposed to be a good guy or a bad guy? And I felt like I had been a challenge and made him a human man who had his flaws and did bad things sometimes, but he was not all bad. And he loved his son, somehow, in some ways. Although I'm so disappointed in him. Anyway, so... I mean, that's my attack. I just uh, heard a little story about getting to uh, just working for money. You do enjoy the work, it's much more pleasant. So, is there any way in which a villain's story, whether it's yours or a villain that you interacted with, could have gone further. They would have wanted to see more of that kind of a, a emotional thread or, or a villainous thread that they, they had started. That's hard because the writers were really good at fleshing out the characters, especially the villains. And my first instinct when you asked that question was to say, well, another Mr. Freeze would have been wonderful. Just because Michael and Sarah was such a wonderful actor, he gave such passion to that character. Um, but then I was thinking about the stuff I did with him, like Sub Zero and Heart of Ice, and I was thinking, I kind of did do that, you know, because the writers were so good at it. So it's it's a hard question to answer because our writers were amazing. That's why. I can't tell you how many people have come to my table today with their kids or their grandkids. Three they generations. They said, oh, they're just getting into it now and they can't stop watching it. Like because it's such high quality. curious like what kind of inspired I feel like uh, your portrayal of uh, Lionel was probably one of my favorite voices of Allville so what kind of motivated what was kind of your inspiration what you used to play on to Lionel and uh, also for a uh, BTS cast is there any chance we'll ever see of something to bridge what happened between uh, Justice League and Bad and Beyond? So let's do about one part at a time. So love <laughs> is my no, no truly love. I, I put that ingredient in and a lot of it. And sometimes it was heavy with love, and sometimes there was anger, but, but, but there was a base of love that I think, uh, uh, an and enjoyment of, of his, his cleverness. So it, he was sort of like the Riddler in, in a little way, and his cockiness, and his feeling about himself. Cock is a good word, isn't it? It is. <laughs> the, but you know, the bottom line on anyone who plays a villain is that they don't get to look at, them, at themselves as playing a villain. They think they're the hero of the story, and what they're doing is the right thing to do. And if you play that, in other words, if you don't judge the character the way the audience is going to, it really flushes it out. With Poison Ivy, even though it was such a great story, I, I, I introduced my granddaughter, when she was about five years old, to watch one of the series. Um, and she watched it and she went, Grandma, 
she's not very nice, is she? <laughs> and I said, no, honey, and I had such a good time playing. <laughs> You know, it's interesting, um, John, you had said that you wanted to put a lot of love and heart into Lionel, and he evolved into kind of a good, like a fully straightforward good character by, by the end of his storyline, and I feel like as a viewer, that the writers were responding to your, to your performance. They, yeah, they were picking up stuff that I was doing, they, they saw what I was going for, and they, they came along with me, I guess. We came together. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> and on that same note, Diane, uh, prior to your performance, Poison Ivy had always been a straightforward villain. And I think uh, it was through your performance, where she didn't see herself as a bad person, that no. she is now an anti-hero. She's now considered to be sometimes one of the good guys. Well, it's the wildest thing, isn't it? You know, because she really... I mean, she's evil, guys. She kills people. <laughs> you know, let's just be very clear. You don't get for fun. You know, <laughs> but they deserve but, it. They deserve but, it. But she has a through line, which is I am trying to save the planet, and that is noble and wonderful. So what a dichotomy for the character, and how much fun to play her. Oh, I had such a good time. So. was the Batman Beyond series takes place many decades later. So I guess would there ever be a chance from your point of view as voice actors to reprise the same roles of these characters in the decades in between? In between Batman We're and I'm available. Oh yeah. My agent is waiting. Come on. Hello. Let's let's start a write-in campaign please. The onus is on you. We all look to your characters more as like ideologies and mythologies that we follow in our own hearts and like grow with. Who inspires you guys very often from the past when you were doing the roles as well as even today? Huh. So are there any other either real life people or maybe other actors that inspired you? Well, uh, uh, when I was introduced to Batman, um, it was literally at the audition. I had only known Adam West's take on the show. I had never read any of the comic books. So I didn't know this dark, gritty, um, dual identity uh, aspect of that. I didn't, I didn't know the drama of it. And uh, Bruce Tim kind of had to take me up to speed. And when he described it to me, what he's really doing, I said, well, you're, this is the Robin Hood story. This is a, a retelling of Robin Hood. And the more I thought about it, there was this wonderful movie from the 40s or the 30s with um, Leslie Howard called um, The Scarlet Pimpernel. And if you've never seen it, you should see it. It's a great movie. And he plays this aristocrat from the French court during the terror of the French Revolution. And he saves people who are going to be guillotined at night. And the way he disguises himself during the day is he's this fop in the court, you know? He's, he's flamboyant, he's uh, sarcastic, he's the center of, he's the brunt of humor, he's the exact opposite of who he is at night. And so that, that inspired me, was, was that performance. I thought, wouldn't that be interesting if Bruce Wayne and Batman were that different? If Bruce Wayne was this sarcastic, charming playboy, and Batman was this dark, brooding vigilante. And that's where I came up with the idea for two voices. So, so that did inspire me. And I later found out, just like six months ago, um, do you know the book, uh, The Boy Who Loved Batman? It's a great book. Uh, Michael uh, Uslan. Um, he told me, and I didn't know this, 
that Bob Kane's inspiration for Batman was the Scarlet Pimpernel. Oh! <laughs> Isn't that wild? I never knew that. Isn't that interesting how two artists' brains can go to the same place? And it's an obscure place. Because when Michael heard me say that during an interview, he said, well, you know Bob Kane, that was his inspiration for the role. I said, no, no one's ever told me that. Isn't that wild? That's a great story. I didn't come to Poison Ivy. I didn't even know uh, about Poison Ivy. Um, I just came, I, I happened to, I happened to come to the, the, the first recording, Poison, uh, Pretty Poison, which was her first uh, appearance, uh, as a, get, a little an incidental role, you know, a secretary or a policewoman or something like that. And the actress that was supposed to play Poison Ivy uh, didn't, for various reasons. And Andrea came up to me and said, would you like to audition for this? And I looked at the character, and to me she looked like Tinkerbell on hormones. <laughs> you know? and, and, I, and I said, okay, tell me about her. And he says, you know, well, she plants, and she this, and she that. And she uses her feminine stuff to get places. And I went, oh, I had two voices in my head immediately. I didn't, I didn't have a person. I had a voice, which was my cosmetic voice, which I used all the time when I was trying to sell perfume <laughs> or various other things. <laughs> and then she was a PhD, Dr. Pamela Isley. So I said, oh, she has brains. And I've always been told that when I talk, I really sound intelligent, that my voice just sounds, I mean, this has nothing to do with anything except this is how I sound, intelligent. So I said, okay, so I'll do the sexy voice, but I'll put a little edge in it so that you think that she's kind of got something else going on. Woo! Woo! So that was my inspiration. And then I read the script. And I went, oh, boy! <laughs> so it's really kind of fun. John, is there anyone who's inspired you? Oh, God. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> oh, oh, no. I'm not, I'm just... Again, I repeat, it was these three scripts that were, were written so well that I had a blast doing it. I didn't realize what was going on. I'd never watched it. I, I mean, I was a grown-up, so I wasn't going to watch Saturday morning cartoons, I thought. And it, it was at these Comic-Cons that I learned how meaningful they, they, they are for so many people. So this was an awakening for me. I, when ignorance is bliss, was my folly to be wise. So I just, you know, had a blast. And somehow it, because of a great script, worked. And then there you are. Shine He's down. just a natural. It's that simple. <laughs> so. John, as an aside, it occurs to me you also acted alongside Poison Ivy in live action. Batman and Uma Thurman. Oh boy, you know. Was that similar at all to working on the show? Similar? No. <laughs> no, because Uma, Poison Ivy, had to kill me. And she killed me with a kiss. And now there was Uma Thurman. And she just, she would just mess up all the time. So we kept having to do it again and again and again and again. And it's turned on my throat. And I, and finally, finally she got it. So it was about 25 takes, and it was just a rough day. I hope you don't believe me, because I just made this up. It was a dream. I have had many nights. Holy Musical Batman. It's free on YouTube. Um, it's a lot of fun. There's they make up a new villain. His name is Candy Man, and he poisons the Gotham Bar supply with a giant worm. Um, it's a fun time. Any uh, actual question is you were talking about how you kind of built the voice for Poison Ivy. I was wondering 
um, for our group, for a lot of people, the voices that the characters are just kind of the different voices of the characters that are in the comics, they just hear the voices. So how did you kind of create those voices and sort of make it sound like the character voice or create the character voice? So where did that voice come from? That unique voice that when we see Riddler, see Poison Ivy, see Batman or Bruce Wayne? I've already answered this. Fair. So then John and Kevin? I just was me. I didn't know you had to make up a voice. I just did it. I had fun doing it. It was that stupid thing where I, I could see that he thinks he's smarter than every person in the world. So that cocky. And that's cocky, your cocky, voice. Cocky, cocky, cocky. John, you're just an enigma. Yeah. <laughs> I'm here all week. Yeah. Um, I came up with it during the audition because I was kind of dancing as fast as I could. You know, I was just improvising in front of the producers, and they described the character, his drama, right? the tragedy of his youth, and I just put myself into that head. And I was thinking about watching my parents murdered in front of me in an alley in Gotham and where that would send me or how I would compensate for that. And I just went to this dark, broody, sexy voice. <laughs> <clears throat> so, you know, voice actors use their imaginations. And uh, that's where you find the voice. Kevin, I wanted to ask you a question. You mentioned uh, your audition a few times. You recently had an autobiographical comic published. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you about that because that was really amazing. Um, that published in, I think, was it DC Pride? Yeah. Um, can you tell us about the experience, about what made you want to write that, and what it was like getting on the page and seeing an artist experience alive? Well, I've always, um, I enjoy writing. I've always enjoyed it, and um, they, the DC asked me for Pride Month, they were going to do a special edition, um, and would I be willing to write uh, a story uh, about being an actor, and I'm 66, I've been acting since I was 20, and, um, oh, you know, gay, and working in a business that was not terribly gay friendly. And uh, they wanted to know what it was like to work. And I thought they're looking for a, a, a feel-good story, I'm sure. And I said to them, well, you know, it's not going to be a feel-good story, if I'm going to be honest. So I decided to make it as personal. You know, writing is only... It's only good if it costs you something. If there's a certain amount of blood on the page. You expose yourself. If you play it safe, you never create anything interesting. You have to take risks. All art is like that. So I thought, I'm just going to lay it out there. Tell these very ugly incidents that happened from my early career um, that are kind of unbelievable now when you read them. You think, oh, no one would actually say that to an actor. But they did. Um, and the, and the personal trauma that people always forget that actors are people. And we carry burdens just like you all do. Um, I had a father who was a, a, a fall down drunk, a very abusive man, a, a, a cruel person who I ended up taking care of in his old age. I had a brother who was severely schizophrenic and I supported him for 35 years until he just passed a year ago. So, these are aspects of actors' lives that you never hear about because people don't advertise that stuff. Um, it's just what you live with. And I thought that would be so interesting to use those dramas of my life to show that when you're dealing with the bullshit of the business, pardon my French, you're also dealing with the bullshit of life, like all humans do. Um, so that's what I wanted people to get at. And, and I think they have. The, the, the reaction has been really positive. Bravo.
question is initially for uh, John Glover. Going from Batman the Animated Series, of, of, sorry, Batman and Robin first, and then going to Batman the Animated Series, uh, what were the different challenges that you had versus acting versus voice acting for those two roles? Was the, the roles were so different. I mean, Dr. Woodrow was uh, insane in one way, and uh, Riddler is insane in another way. So, I just, the, the look first, because I, I wanted the Bride of Frankenstein kind of hair, that helped. Um, and, uh, I, it's all down to, again, imagination and, you know, what you do when you trying to figure out who somebody is and how you can make them interesting and... Uh, yeah. And he had fun. Yeah. <laughs> and I had fun. <laughs> um, also, just to all of you, going from like an acting, um, voice acting into acting, what was your favorite between the two? Would you prefer voice acting or actual acting? That's hard. Because they're... You know, I think acting on stage is always going to be my first love. I just love it. Because of that, that communication that happens with the audience. You know when they're with you, and you know when they're not with you. Uh, there's an energy in a theater I just love. Yeah, and it's always different. And you're on your own. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you can't cut. If you lose a word, you got to figure it out how yeah, to get out. Yeah. And it is, the audience is give so much back yeah. to uh, uh, actors on the stage. Yeah. It, it's a whole other world when you're acting on stage and or for the camera. Um, there's so much work you have to do to get to that point to be able to do that. Whereas, frankly, with voice work, you audition, you get it or you don't, and then you go to the studio. You don't have to worry if you have a pimple, if you've gained 10 pounds. I'm serious. If your voice isn't... if the, there's just stuff that's it's a different kind of career that's not what the question was but that's very much part of it for me I've always adored being in front of an audience as you can tell I mean I'm, look at you guys come on but I, I but I know but I, I, I love acting and I love acting on stage but I found voice work more satisfying in my personal life because I got to raise children, make a decent living, work part-time, so I could be home with them, those kinds of things. So I don't know if that answers anything, but it sort of is what it is. I think one thing to remember about that, about the different venues for acting, is that TV is really the, the venue of the writers. They're in charge. Film is the venue of the director. He's in charge. He controls what gets on. I feel like. Theater is the venue of the actor. Well said. Because when you're on stage, you create that moment. And you control the dialogue with the audience. So that's just naturally, I think, where most actors feel more alive. I think we only have time for about one or two more questions. Great question so far, guys. Yeah, really good questions. I'm really loving these, by the way. And, and out of curiosity, is there ever a time when a voice actor showed up with the Batman Animated Series, just pajamas and like slippers and stuff? No, we would uh, probably call the police. <laughs> uh, so these uh, characters, they're easy to get along. And, uh, but I feel the late 80s and the early 90s was a great moment to reinvent Batman and all these characters. Uh, and the great thing about them is they had so much heart. Um, a lot of it was, of course, the script, but it's what you bring to the table. And Thank I remember you. scenes like, uh, you know, uh, Poison Ivy and Harley Quinn when they get together, and Poison Ivy giving tips to Harley Quinn about love life, and Batman dealing with the ghost of his father when facing Scarecrow. There was so much heart in it that gives, uh, that there was nuance to these characters. And I'm wondering, you've had 30 years to chew on these characters. Uh, can you tell us uh, about your understanding of who these characters are? Well, I think one thing to remember is that these, these shows were never kid shows. They had to be kid-friendly, but they were really geared towards 
young adults, like college age. That was the biggest audience. Batman the Animated Series originally was a prime time show on Fox. That's how it started. Um, so those characters are complicated. They show the passion and the pathos of Mr. Freeze, even as he's trying to wipe out a city. You know? That's complicated. Uh, so for actors, that gives you so much to chew on. You know? Uh, but no, you're right. The, the, the characters are so well-rounded. And I think that's why audiences today, who get introduced to it now, get so excited about it. Anyone else? I should watch it sometime. <laughs> and just see, I mean, I... Uh, watch Michael and Sarah do Mr. Fritz. It's unbelievable. Okay. <laughs> Alright, one last question. So my question is kind of related to what Kevin just mentioned about him kind of setting his gear toward more group adults. I remember like the animated series Justice League and Static Shock were kind of marketed towards kids. But I hear like, I would always hear like when I was in kindergarten and people would be like, oh this show was too dark or things like that. Do you feel like there were ever like episodes or things that you felt were like too dark for like the younger audiences? I, I actually did. I, I mean, and I, they were very aware of it. Because they, Bruce Tim, wanted to push the boundaries. He absolutely wanted to. And Warner Brothers pushed back. Uh, because they wanted it to be kid friendly. So there were moments where I thought, whoa, this is getting a little heavy. Um, so yes, that, that, that was an issue that came up. I had no control over anything. I was simply saying the words that the people wrote for me. Yeah. That's it. Wah, O.C. <laughs> didn't know I was multilingual, did you? <laughs> I was just thinking of the Riddler being trapped in his own mind for a while. And I'm like, that's, that's a really dark episode to see as a kid. You know? But, uh, it was kind of, <laughs> I, I, sorry, I feel like I went too far. <laughs> I think you're swell. <laughs> Well, on that note, I want to thank all of you so much for coming here, and I want to thank you guys so much for those questions. And come visit us at our tables. Okay? John, Diane, and Kevin are going to be at the tables for about 10 more minutes today, but they are going to be there all day tomorrow as well. So, thank you all we so much. Closing soon. Thank you all. We'll be here tomorrow.